physics and it's EM or electromagnetic spectrum. So, prior knowledge then, what you should know from key stage three, you should be able to recall that waves can be transverse or longitudinal. You should also describe properties of waves such as frequency, wavelength and amplitude. Finally, you should be able to describe examples of transverse and longitudinal waves such as light and sound. So by the end of this lesson, hopefully what you should be able to do is describe the electromagnetic spectrum as a continuous spectrum, labeling it in terms of frequency and wavelength. You should also be able to describe the uses and dangers of the long wavelengths. And finally, the uses and dangers of a short wavelength. So this covers pretty much the most of the unit for key stage for GCSE physics. So electromagnetic waves then, we can see light with our eyes. We can also see objects that reflect light. And that light is reflected into our eyes, giving us the image of what we can see. Light is an example then of an electromagnetic wave. It's made up of both an electric and a magnetic component oscillating at right angles to each other. And for this reason, electromagnetic waves have zero electrical charge. So this is what we mean by an electric and a magnetic component oscillating at right angles to each other. You can see the red line denotes the electric field and the blue line denotes the magnetic field in the diagram below. And the electric field and magnetic field are at right angles to each other in terms of the direction of energy flow. So properties of electromagnetic waves. Sir. These are things that you can be asked about in your GCSE exams. All electromagnetic waves are transverse. That means that as they travel through a medium, the oscillations of the wave are at right angles to the direction in which the energy transfers. All electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed in a vacuum. They can travel without a medium, but in a vacuum, they travel at the fastest speed there is, which is three times 10 to the eight or 300 million meters every second. All electromagnetic waves transfer energy from a source to an observer, but they do not transfer matter. This is important. They don't transfer any matter. They just carry energy from one place in space to another. So we start off with visible light then. Our eyes can detect certain frequencies of light and we can call this particular group of frequencies visible light because it's visible to us. Different frequencies in this range cause us to see different colors. So red has a different frequency to orange, which has a different frequency to yellow and so on all the way down to violet. Lower frequencies of light appear to be more red in color. They lie towards the red end of the spectrum, whereas higher frequencies of light appear to be more blue. This is the visible spectrum in front of you, and you can see the lower frequencies down this side, higher frequencies this way. And as we go along with increasing frequency, there's our visible spectrum going from red over on the left-hand side, where it's obviously red, all the way to violet on the right-hand side, just before it hits the ultraviolet. So around visible light then, animals such as birds and insects can detect electromagnetic waves that are outside our vis visible range, things that we can't see. This then means that their eyes can detect frequencies that are higher and lower than visible light for ourselves. So I'm gonna show you a picture now of the flower and this particular flower is a marshmallow gold that's shown in both the visible, what we can see spectrum and in the ultraviolet spectrum, what uh, pollinating insects like a honeybee can see. And you can see there's a massive difference in what we can see in terms of the detail. The yellow flower is what we can see in the visible light and the ultraviolet reflection is the light on the, uh, the marshmallow gold, same flower on the right hand side picture where you can see actually now that the um, filament and the anthers are highlighted by this black region around it and this is to indicate to pollinating insects that that area contains nectar um, to get them to come down to walk through it, collect pollen and transfer it to the next plant for pollination. So one thing we've got to remember then from that last couple of slides, if I remember anything, the colour of visible light depends on its frequency. So the frequency of light determines the colour. If the frequency of an electromagnetic wave is lower than that of red light, human eyes can't see it. We can't detect it with our eyes. Infrared, microwaves and radio waves are all electromagnetic waves, but their frequencies are lower than visible light, which is why we can't see them with our eyes. On the other side of it, if the frequency of an electromagnetic wave is higher than that of violet light, again, human eyes cannot see it or detect it. Ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays are all electromagnetic waves with frequencies that are higher than visible light. Again, 
Colour of visible light depends on its frequency. You've got to keep that in your head. The full range of electromagnetic waves, then, from radio waves all the way down to gamma, is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And this is the whole spectrum from start to finish that you need to know about for GCSE. So we've got radio waves over on the left-hand side, moving down to microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. And it's useful to try and come up with a mnemonic at this point, something that allows you to remember those particular uh, waves in order. Um, you know, it, it can be anything that will work for you. Um, I don't know, Royal Men in Venice, ultimately x-ray gates i don't know something daft that can stick in your head that you can remember it with whatever works for you we're just getting that in order once you've got that order as well you need to make sure that your starting point whether you're starting with r for radio or g for gamma you know what the frequency and wavelength is there so if i start off with radio for example i'm talking about the lowest frequency and the highest wavelength because radio has a wavelength in the thousands of meters and as i move along down the scale towards gamma i'm talking about an increasing frequency increasing energy and a decreasing wavelength because according to the wave equation where wave speed equals frequency times wavelength if i increase the frequency but the wave speed stays the same the wavelength has to decrease in uh, opposition to it another thing to remember the electromagnetic spectrum is continuous as all values of frequency are possible as you can see from the colors of visible light in this particular diagram there's not one point where it stops being red and starts being orange or where it stops being orange and starts being yellow. It kind of blends through. And it's that blending where the frequencies of one are overlapping the frequencies of another, which means that they are continuous. Any value of frequency is possible within that range and it doesn't have to be a whole number frequency. It's convenient then, or easier, to think of the full spectrum that we've got there is seven groups or family groups or ranges of waves as labeled above with radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma being the labels. Higher frequency waves have lower wavelengths, and that means they transfer more energy because there's more waves per second and each wave delivers energy. This makes the higher frequency waves more dangerous to humans than the shorter wavelengths. So that's our first outcome. Describe the electromagnetic spectrum as a continuous spectrum, labeling it in terms of frequency and wavelength. Second one. In the straightforward one, describe the uses and dangers of the long wavelengths. I'm actually going to say these two particular outcomes, there's a big argument that pupils sometimes forget that sometimes there are just stories in science and these stories need to be recalled even if you don't understand why. These two are kind of stories of science. What do we use them for and why are they dangerous? Even if you don't understand that you should be able to quote both a use and a danger of each of these types of uh, electromagnetic waves. So let's get going on that then. Uses and dangers of the long wavelengths. We've already said the full range of electromagnetic waves is called the electromagnetic spectrum. The long wavelengths then are the group of electromagnetic waves with wavelengths longer than visible light. These are radio waves, microwaves, and infrared waves. But let's start at the beginning, radio waves. This is where they are on the scale, and this is denoted by the blue arrow. Radio waves are used for transmitting information. So we use them for radio broadcasts, TV programs, and some satellite communications. Some radio communications are also sent by satellites in space. So we've got the astronaut there on the space walking the diagram. Controllers on the ground at NASA and ESA, that's the National American Space Agency and European Space Agency, they communicate with spacecraft using radio waves. Particular frequencies, radio waves can pass through the atmosphere and reach vehicles in space. Because radio waves have such long wavelengths and such short frequencies, they have no known dangers associated with their use, meaning that as far as we're aware, there is nothing that radio waves do to the human body or to human tissue. Microwaves. Now you've heard of this before, because obviously most people, if not everyone, has a microwave in their kitchen. But microwave ovens transfer energy to the thermal store of food, heating it up from the inside. What that means is that microwaves can actually penetrate into the food and cook it from the outside in by adding heat energy to uh, oils and water within the molecule, within the, the food, making it um, heat up from the inside. Some microwave frequencies can heat water. In humans, our cells mostly contain water. So it was thought in the past that mobile phones, which use microwave frequencies, um, could cause water in cells near to your ears and your brain, because you're holding your phone like this, would heat up, causing damage and possibly brain tumors. It's something that's been debunked, should I say, by years of research now. So 
on that note, microwaves can also be used for communications and satellite transmission. Microwaves are the electromagnetic waves that we use for mobile phone signals. As mobile phones use different microwave frequencies, scientists state that it is safe to use a mobile phone without cell damage from heating. Use different microwave frequencies from the microwave oven. And there's our microwave on the scale, 10 to the minus two wavelength. Infrared then. Now, infrared radiation can be used for communication, but only short distances. It was before Bluetooth. Most mobile phones had what was called an infrared port. And I don't know if you're watching this now, whether you remember this, but an infrared port on a mobile phone was pretty much like the, the little bulb get, that you get on the front of a remote. And um, what you'd have to do is you'd have to line up your phone with someone else's phone, literally bulb to bulb. And you'd leave it there and it'd take about half an hour to transfer, say, a couple of songs worth of data across. It was very slow. And if you moved it from too far away, say more than, I don't know, half a meter, 50 centimeters at most, then you'd lose the connection and the data would be lost and you'd have to start all over again. That was when Bluetooth was used. Now, it's a pain, but actually it's not a problem for things like remote controls for televisions or for a device like a satellite box or wherever. We don't have to be too close and you don't have to worry about large amounts of data. It can just be a pulse. So we use it for communication via remotes and via devices. Uh, your TV remote controller, even the information sent along optical fibers that allows me to send this down the internet to your homes without actually being there with you is an example of the use of infrared. Other than that, a hot object, such as a grill or a toaster, can transfer energy to food via infrared radiation. The food then absorbs the radiation on the surface of the food. This is unlike microwaves, which cook from the inside out. Infrared's absorbed by the surface. It can't penetrate inside, into the food. So it's absorbed at the surface and cooks from the outside in. Thermal images also show the amount of thermal radiation given off by an object. There's a thermal image there of what looks like a chihuahua, it's a dog. Um, Security system, oh sorry, security systems have sensors that can detect infrared emit, radiation emitted from the bodies of burglars, which is really useful when you consider that most of the time burglars will try to burgle a place when it's dark, so not much visible light is present. So a normal security camera might miss them because it's too dark. Whereas infrared given off from the bodies can be picked up even in dark because you're not reliant on visible light, you're reliant on the heat coming from their bodies. The other way that this works is you can use uh, infrared because it's invisible to the naked eye for infrared beams that cross doors. And if the burglar can't see it, they don't know it's there when they pass through, they set off the sensor and the alarm that way. Our skin also absorbs infrared radiation. We feel this as getting hotter or warmer. Too much infrared radiation can damage or destroy cells on the surface. So this leads to skin surface burns. And it's often what happens when people run um, into house fires to rescue people uh, without the proper protective clothing like firemen or, or in the event that someone is caught up near a fire or they put hands too close to one skin surface burns from the absorbed infrared radiation. Visible light. Visible light is our midpoint in the spectrum. Visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can detect. Light bulbs are designed to emit visible light. The cameras are designed to detect and record images with it. Visible light, most people think there are no dangers associated with it, but there is one. A very intense or very bright visible light can cause damage to the eyes or in severe cases, blindness. It's one of the reasons you're taught pretty much from being a child, don't look at intense radiation sources like the sun because the bright visible light can actually cause damage to your eyes. And it's also the reason that people can suffer from what's called snow blindness um, in uh, um, ski out resorts where people are skiing a lot, you tend to wear protection on your eyes because the snow reflects lots and lots of bright visible light back into the eyes and it can lead to temporary blindness. So that's the uses and the dangers of the long wavelengths. Final part of the lesson, uses and dangers of the short wavelengths. Here we go, home stretch. So ultraviolet light transfers more energy than visible radiation. It can be absorbed by most of the same materials that absorb visible light, including human skin. It's here on our spectrum, 10 to the minus eight wavelength. It can be used to kill microorganisms and disinfect water in places where clean water is in short supply. We basically fill plastic bottles with water that's been filtered down as much as possible to remove any debris, dirt, any contaminants that are visible to the naked eye. But then we leave it on a, a silvered surface like um, a foil background or a foil blanket in bright sunlight for a 24 hour period and the intense UV light will kill off any microorganisms that are left in the water. 
Now, this is an interesting one. Some materials absorb UV radiation and re-emit it as visible light in a process called fluorescence. Fluorescent materials are often used in security markings. For example, invisible ink can absorb infrared, sorry, ultraviolet radiation and re-emit it when it's under a UV lamp as white light. And this is why we can see invisible ink under a UV light, but not under visible light. Um, another example is the security markings in MUNA. This is a euro. We can see the five stars there that are bright orange. The dots that are there, these are produced under UV light. You would not see them in normal visible light. In the case of English MUNA, the Great British Pound, you would see a brightly coloured five on a five pound note, a 10 on a 10 pound note and a 20 on a 20 in um, a mix of red and green inks. And that's produced by fluorescent markings. And they're, they're there to prevent counterfeits or um, fake money being put into the market. And there's an example of a 10 and a 20 pound note marking. It's called a Urian mark for those that are interested. So continue with ultraviolet light, many low energy bulbs are UV lights. So strip lights, for example, strip lights are a plasma type light that contain a gas. And when you pass a current through it, that gas glows with UV light and it actually emits UV light. Now we can't see this, but inside the bulb, there is a white coating and that white coating is fluorescent. So it absorbs the UV light being produced and then re-emits it as visible white light. It's why when you turn the light on for a strip light, it takes a second or two for the light to be re-emitted so you see flickering while it's uh, absorbing and then re-emitting the UV light. Now dangers of it, sunlight contains high frequency UV light which carries more energy than UV radiation. This energy can often be absorbed by the skin and cause sunburn. Too much exposure too often can lead to DNA damage. Ultraviolet light can penetrate into the skin to the surface layer and that then can cause skin cancer because if you damage the DNA leads to mutations, which eventually will lead to cancerous cells forming. So to prevent this, we wear sun cream because sun cream can absorb the UV light and prevent it from passing through to the skin. And we wear clothing that absorbs this energy instead of our skin. And we can stay out of the sun in the hottest part of the day to avoid skin damage. UV radiation can also damage human eyes. Um, skiers and mountain climbers can suffer temporary snow blindness due to reflected UV from snowfields. We protect our eyes with sunglasses. If you have too much sunlight in your eyes, it can lead to the formation of cataracts, which need surgery to remove them. X-rays. Now, X-rays are a type of electromagnetic mediation that can pass through most of the materials that all the previous rays can't, with the exception of bone. So they pass through muscles and fat easily, but bone absorbs some X-rays. This then means that x-rays can be used in medicine to make images where we suspect that someone has damaged the bones or broken the bones and it allows us to pinpoint it without cutting into the person and leading to the risk of an infection. X-rays can also be used to examine the insides of metal objects and to inspect luggage in airport security scanners. This is actually quite a topical thing. It's been in the news quite recently because airports that are installing these uh, being um, asked what privacy measures they're putting in place for people of different religions or different faiths, or even just in the sense of um, how do we know that you're not you know, using these improperly. So it's quite a topical thing at the minute. Um, you can see different images here where we can see objects that have been swallowed by different organisms. So we've got a key that's been swallowed here by a child in a child's x-ray. We've got a duck. You can just make the duck out around here in the um, stomach of the dog. And then here we've got someone making the uh, rock arm sign with their fingers to show the finger bones. Finally, gamma rays. Gamma rays transfer lots of energy. They're the most powerful waves in the electromagnetic spectrum because they deliver a lot of energy in a very short space of time. For this reason, they can be used to sterilize food and surgical instruments by killing potentially harmful microorganisms. If you're going into surgery, you will find that gamma rays will be used to kill uh, any microorganisms that are on top of the um, surgical implements because they'll be placed in a cabinet and be irradiated before use as well as being cleaned in normal ways. Gamma rays can also be used to kill cancer cells in a process called radiotherapy. Um, we can fire a beam of weak gamma rays. So by weak, I mean they're not enough to kill cells, but they're enough to hurt them. If we fire one beam, and then we fire another and another and another from different directions across the site of the tumor, but all the beams cross 
at the site of the tumor, meaning that all the cells around it get a low dose of gamma rays, but the cells where the tumor site is get a collective dose where all the rays are crossing, they get more than one dose. And this then allows them to help kill the cancer cells or shrink it down so it's manageable. We can also use them to detect cancer with a chemical that emits gamma rays being injected into the blood called the gamma tracer. This chemical then collects inside the cancer cells and we put a camera around the body, which then allows the cancer to be spotted by finding the point in the body where all the gamma rays are coming from. This is because gamma rays can pass through all materials in the body, including bone. So this allows us to pinpoint wherever it is. And that's the final use described the uses and dangers of the short wavelengths.